Broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studios in Phoenix, Arizona, it's time for Phoenix Business Radio, spotlighting the city's best businesses and the people who lead them. Hello and welcome to Phoenix Business Radio, broadcasting live from the Max 6 Entrepreneurial Center right here in Tempe, Arizona, where we help build businesses and connect you with the right people. I'm very excited to connect you with this right person. Helga Faber has become a dear friend, a client of mine, and now uh, we've got some collaborative projects in the works together. Please welcome Helga Faber to the studio. He is the author of Taming Your Crocodiles and the founder of the Growth Leaders Network. Welcome to the studio. So glad to be here. It's a pleasure. It's a home away from home for you. Yes, yes. I get to be here Almost every two weeks uh, for Rooted and Wavering, which has been such a blessing. Thank you for suggesting and creating this space. So I would love just to have our audience get to know you, hopefully as warmly and as quickly as I got to know you. I think it's been, has it been two years since you were a guest on my show? A year and a half. A year and a half. Wow. Fantastic. Okay, so Growth Leaders Network, or do you want to start with Taming Your Crocodiles, or do you want to start one day, you know, <laughs> one day. the waves parted? <laughs> Where do you want to start? Well, I'll start maybe with my own story a little bit. Please. Because that, that's how all these things started to come, and this is also how I'm finding myself here today. So once upon a time, <laughs> no. there was a little boy in the north of the Netherlands who loved the fields and the churches and the big organ music and felt so awe struck by life. I grew up on a dairy farm, which was beautiful in many ways. And then some things happened. And I lost my sense of awe, you could say. I got distracted. I became very entranced by this thing of achievement. So instead of making music, which I loved to do as a young person, I went into the business world head on and I became a a strategy consultant in New York City. I rose to the top very fast. I was the youngest partner in my strategy consulting company together with another person. And I was very proud of that. And inside of me, it was a mess. I felt very torn, like never really at ease. I would even walk a little hunched. I didn't sleep very well. Uh, Sometimes I wouldn't sleep for an entire week. And that really changed things. At some point, it got so bad that my body started to have symptoms like inflammations and things. And at that point, I discovered meditation. And in the ego mind that I was, like, oh, I discovered meditation. And I still remember showing up at a meditation retreat with Pema Children in my boss jacket and like suitcase, like Devil Wars product kind of thing. Like I didn't bring my assistant, but I did show up in a black limo on this mountain retreat. I still remember this. I did and, not know this. It, crazy. And I was expecting that I was going to be the only person sitting in that room or maybe 10 other people. And there were f- four or 500 and I felt offended, I remember. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Because you created this. <laughs> yeah. And I thought that I was going to be the leader as I always was and the special one. And then I started listening to Pema and everything she said made sense to me. And basically it was... I was drawn to her by a book that she wrote called When Things Fall Apart. Mm. And things were falling apart. So I did some meditation. I could sleep again. And I discovered a sense of ease, peace, joy, kindness that reminded me of that little child once upon a time. And I said, okay, this is it. I'm going to be a monk, right? Because that sort of ego personality was... I've got it. I've got to claim it. I have to control it because I can't trust the world, which is, was one of the root causes of me having to achieve so much mm-hmm. because I didn't trust things. So I basically went into high performance mode, which I still do, uh, but I don't watch it. And anyway, through all of that, long story short, I just decided not to go into the monastery and instead uh, do this work of coaching and culture and team development, which is all focused on connecting with our true self our potential, which basically boils down to three principles, truth, love, and purposefulness. And that's basically what then became a book, Taming Your Crocodiles, what became the firm that I lead, Growth Leaders Network, and is my daily practice. Like my number one client is me. 
I, I get to be a witness <laughs> to that, <laughs> which is incredible. The way in which you and I interact with each other is the kind of relationship and accountability, respect, and compassion and connectedness that I wish for every relationship. Mm-hmm. And I know you aren't the same. I'm fortunate to have incredible relationships. And so to meet somebody so recently and have us just both have done our own journey towards that makes it uh, very rewarding. So thank you for that. Same here. Same here. Makes it very easy once you've traveled a little while and then say, hey, Karen, and then for you sharing and then, yeah, that's growth that happens. That's a recent thing for me because I still have a little bit of this monk energy. It was like when things don't go well, I retreat Mm -hmm. and go into my shell. And I'm learning recently that actually a lot of growth happens and enjoyment happens being together with other people who knew. Yeah. And we've had some crunchy conversations. Not all of our conversations have been easy ones. <laughs> right. Which is delightful. Right. And it's interesting to me because we can now talk about crunchy like with a little sparkle in our eyes. And I remember when we're in the crunchy conversations that there may not have been the sparkle, but what was there was a sense of deep respect for each other and for our own process Mm -hmm. and saying, I I remember you saying something about I'm on this journey or I'm in this journey of I'm processing or me saying, you know, what's true for me in this moment. And I don't know exactly where that's going to go. And that to me is the embodiment of the first two principles of connectedness. For me, for me, they're trying to boil things down to three so I can remember just for me. Otherwise I forget like truth, being truthful and loving, like being true to myself not knowing where that's going to go. I, I ended up in the studio because I was truthful to myself, right? Because that, otherwise I would have never met you. I followed what I thought was important, which was working on climate, which I still do with ASU. And that's how we got in the studio. And that's how I met you and, and so on and so forth. And in that conversation of crunch, also being loving, saying, huh, Karen's saying something that may be different from how I see it. Hmm. Even pushes my buttons. <laughs> Let my buttons be pushed. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. And I think also letting go of the um, the attachment to what the outcome is supposed to look like, I yes. think is one of the things that, we, that we've that we committed to with each other. Yes. That, all right, well, let's, let's see where this takes us. And as long as we come back to respect and compassion over and over again, it may move in the direction that we're both doing something together or it may not. And all of it's okay. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. yes. I love how this emerges because that's to me the third principle of connectedness, which is purposefulness as opposed to control. Like I like to think about things in terms of pairs so I can keep an eye on things. So it started off with owls and crocodiles. Yes, talk about that. Which wasn't my idea. It was a therapist I worked with. He said to me, so Hilke, after I blabbed for a while, he'd say, so Hilke, Who's talking right now? Is it your owl, your wise self, or is it your crocodile, your pesky reptilian ego, fear-based situation that's mm-hmm. talking through you? What's what's talking right now? And we had a lot of fun with this because whenever I didn't know, it was usually my crocodile right. <laughs> blabbing. So that sort of distinction between higher self, connecting self, connected self, and disconnected, disconnecting, fearful self, I found that... For my makeup, it seems to help. And I found it also helpful working with teams and corporations because we're so busy. It's like, you know, we're, we're used to profit and loss. So why not owl and crocodile? Something very simple to grab around. And then in terms of the three principles of connectedness, which I've been working with the last year or so, you know, as opposed to truth, it's self-obsession, like being lost in mind. Mm. And when I talk to you and we're in a crunch and I'm lost, then I'm thinking about all these thoughts and uh, I got to be, I got to make this, uh, like, and I'm not present. Yeah. Right? It's so heavy. The, it's hard. It's. Yeah. So it's going from that place of uh, to truth, mm-hmm. the truth of being, which Walt Whitman described. I love this phrase, a place of unfailing sufficiency. Unfailing sufficiency. It's like, it's okay. Yeah. And then as opposed to love respect, judgment. It's like, Karen, how can you think that? Not my business. 
And even if and what you were thinking or saying at the time wasn't actually harmful, but even when people are saying things that are harmful, do I judge them or do I have compassion? Right? That's the second principle. And the third principle, as opposed to being purposeful, like what you elicited here, is having a sense of trying to be in control. Anyway. I still I, I, I also have to kind of work on that one still <laughs> <laughs> a lot. Daryl knows that. So does my 15-year-old son and, yeah. everybody, and everybody who spins in my orbit. And I can make light of it and I can have fun with it. Great. Because I continue to grow and am willing to embrace that part of me. Uh, Taming Your Crocodiles. Did you just describe that what's the essence of that book is, or is there more, or is it different? I'm curious about the book itself. So the book itself came from a course that I was teaching at Columbia Business School Executive Education on leading as coach. It's basically talking about the distinction between tame owls and crocodiles. And also, my intention is with that book to, to provide a journey mm. that leaders, teams, organizations can use to create a more truthful, resonant culture that's more grounded, right? So it, in the book, I share some of my story in terms of helping people understand how we grow. It talks a little bit about different tools to introspect, not the best ones, but a lot focusing on fear versus values. And it talks about how you have conversations with others from a place of respect. And it talks about how you coach others and how you create a culture. So it's like a little guidebook. Mm -hmm. And born out of the workshops and the work that you were doing with corporations and their culture and teams. Yes. And then Growth Leaders Network. For a while, you were flying solo. Is that correct? You were doing this on your own? Yes. And now tell us how Growth Leaders Network came to be and, and how is that different than what you were doing previously? So there's been different iterations to keep the story simple. <laughs> to keep the story simple. I think life always happens just like life is happening between us in this way that I cannot imagine. There's something miraculous about it. So Growth Leaders Network really took off in the Netherlands. How? My brother invited me to be a speaker in a conference. And I did it. I loved it. And then after the speech was over, Three people came up to me and she said, Hilka, this was something we need here right now. We want to work on this. And so that were those were the three founders of Growth Leaders Network in the Netherlands. And so they took the principles of Tame Your Crocodiles and built a whole business around it there. And then I also did that in the United States. And so building a team around that. So that's how that came about. And continue to do the work to help businesses more deeply connect in yeah. addition to reaching their goals and, and filling their purpose. Yeah. And to me, it's all the same thing. So me, it's like, I'm thinking about a, a conversation I had yesterday with a, a leader in a, a large technology company, right? They said to me, what we need help with is we have three people that are not talking to each other and it has tremendous impact on us being to be able to be agile and work with quality. So to me, that, so the first thing is to connect, talk about connectedness with the it, with the task. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, so that, that's where the person can start. Like the objective is not working. It's something is not working. Or we have an aspiration that we're not reaching. That's the first part. And then the second part becomes, so how do we work on that then? Well, part of that is people willing to, this, this, the, third, the second level of connectedness is the connectedness of the relationship. So how, what happens between those three people? Like, so are we having the real conversation, like truly real conversations? I always ask my clients on a scale from one to 10, how honest are you with each other? That's a, hard, a tall order. It's not something to be taken lightly, not brutal honesty, but the real grounded, caring honesty. That's a hard thing to do for most people, including me, mm -hmm. and with deep respect. And then the third level of connectedness is, and so what are you bringing to this team, each of these people on this team, that helps the dynamic that you want and that doesn't help the dynamic? We call those from twos, mm -hmm. old beliefs and new beliefs. 
And that's an individual journey. So it has all three levels of connectedness woven in. My monk self, of course, starts with the I. So I can, it's almost like I'm bored hearing about the task. But then I'm disconnecting with that part. That's my issue, right? I need to be equally interested in the task. We're not delivering with agility and, and quality. The, conf, the, 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 the relationship, we're having a conflict. and people not bringing their full self to this. All three. And that's how we work in connectedness. And and helping people are, and guiding them to be self-reflective through that. Yes. that not, I, I'd imagine that not everybody comes to these conversations with that skill set. Is that really where, mainly where you spend a good portion of the time helping them see themselves in these relationships, not only with other people, but also the task? That's the paradox, isn't it? Because there's always a moment. It starts from helping us understand that we have different mindsets. Some of them are towards a victimhood. All, everything is happening to me, going into judgment. And one is coming from a place of mastery. Everything that's happening here is for my learning. Everything. I su surrender. I'm this moment, right? We talk about this Austrian psychiatrist, Viktor Frankl who basically ended up in four concentration camps and was able to have the wherewithal to stay on the balcony of awareness and say, okay, what's going on here? What can I learn from this? So that's, the, that's one gate the group goes through to understand, and we all go through, and sometimes we have to go through it many, many yeah, times. Yes. Like when I had this conversation with you, why is she doing this to me? <laughs> Didn't we have something good going? Come on, right. Karen, right? <laughs> As opposed to, huh, what am I doing here? What, how am I contributing to this? How will I take responsibility? We also call this the 1% principle. My 1%, even if I think 99% of the situation is something else, it's about my 1%. How Which is the only part you can own anyway. Yes. Hmm. Yes. My 1%. And then when, once I get into it, and I really, as you well know, Karen, as I start digging into that, <laughs> the, the world's not what I think it is. It's how I see it. That's basically got what gets in my way. The how I see it, it gets in my way. It's actually, the world is what it is. It's my task to see it. Mm -hmm. And to see it, and this is where most of the work, to be honest, happens. The, the, meaning the most of the work that truly creates the trans transformational pivot is when the individuals and a sufficient number of individuals start to become enough self-reflective so they start to recognize their own patterns in what happens and makes a different choice. Without making everybody else or themselves wrong right? for the way that it was in the old story. Yeah. Hmm. Isn't that something mm -hmm. that we do that? <laughs> yes. And you and I, in the journeys that we've had, similar but different, What's great that I think what we both bring to our relationship with clients and friends and family and, and peers is that ability to say, I'm checking myself. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I showed up this way in a conversation with you, and now I'm aware that the story I was telling myself is X, Y, Z, and either I apologize or I'm just aware, yes. and, um, and, now I'm, and now I'm here, or now I'm working to being here. That's profound. Yes. And I love that you're pointing out this idea of, or this pointer of, without making ourselves wrong, mm -hmm. which is why the second principle of connectedness is compassion, love. Because that, to me, our human brain go-to survival instinct seems to be when things go not the way I think they should, is to judge, to make it wrong. It's like an instantaneous thing. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge barrier to learning. I, I see it in myself. Like, I'm, I'm so good at making myself wrong. So, so good. And I used to think that wasn't bad to honor. Because now I can make myself wrong. I can feel sorry about for myself. I feel bad. But then nothing happens. Right? But now I can see, okay, maybe in this conversation with Karen, you showed up controlling. I did. I showed a little bit. showed up a controlling in a way. I tried to control an outcome. I wasn't respectful to where you were. Now I could say, ah, Hilka, you were controlling. Bad boy. Mm -hmm. 
I'm going to, I'm going to really make you wrong for this now, as opposed to having compassion for myself and saying, yeah, of course you're going to be controlling. You're a part of the human species. We do that really well. And why do you think you're any different from anybody else? So hold that with compassion. And then miraculously what happens when I allow myself to sit with it, I don't even have to solve it. I can just acknowledge it. Something you've also taught me. It's like, oh, this is what I'm doing. Am I not? Just be present to it. Bring the truth of awareness to it. And and then it's no longer there. And what's interesting about this example (laughs) is that I remember you saying something similar to that as we were kind of debriefing with each other. And I felt none of that on the receiving end. So it's all that's going on for ourselves <laughs> and how we show up, right? So, and that happens in all of our relationships. And, and so when we take it back to the workplace and we have leaders um, who are leading teams, sometimes accidental managers, they weren't really trained or groomed to have those roles, but they're really good at whatever craft that they're at. Joe Puzz talks about that a lot mm-hmm. uh, in his show project management office hours, this accidental manager or this accidental project manager. Great, great word. And so how wonderful that there are folks like you in the world who come, who get to come in and say, let me help make it less complex <laughs> and, and help offer some simplicity around the way in which we work with each other and, and how we can more deeply connect. Yeah, yeah. And you've had a great opportunity to do that with many different companies with many different sizes and multiple multiple industries. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting, Karen, that it's the same everywhere. What what is the same? The confusion is the same. Doesn't matter the language <laughs> or the industry. No, it, it has different flavors. Yeah. Like t- weather types. Maybe different climates even. Like some climates are more judgy and more controlling and more ego, individual centric like a lot of the Western Hemisphere. And then a lot of the more across the pond from Pacific, from here going West, you know, you get more into climate, belief climates that are more about submergence and submission and, you know, following the social norms and not not having an individual idea where there's resignation, resentment, not so much judgment. But but in the end, it's all the same. It's all confusion. It's just different flavors, different spices, you could say, of confusion. And then the great news is when we start to unpeel that and say, ha, huh, that's what we're doing. Mm-hmm. Who's talking right now? Is that your wise self, your connected self, or is that your confused self that's in some fear, past conditioning re- rerun? Same. Yeah. And then we end up in a place of, connectedness, truth, love, service, that's the same everywhere. And I'm grateful that I get to do that. And I liked what you said about simplicity. Simplicity. I just borrowed your words. You, uh, you said a version of that earlier. <laughs> that it really, I, what I hear as you're modeling it just a second ago is helping people see that there is a model. And when we take it out from the personal experience and we can kind of lay it out here and detach ourselves from it, we can become a student or a witness to it. And then be able to go, oh, okay, it's just part of me. It's just a journey. Which yeah. path do I want to choose? Yeah. And then recommitting to that path over and over and over again. Yeah. And then finding a way to, again, have that respect and common ground so that we can move forward on whatever task we are been charged with collectively. Yes, yes, yes. Like putting it on the table in front of us and then making a choice. Well, first of all, the putting on the table takes courage. because. Hmm. When we're in the maelstrom of whatever conditioned patterns it might be, like our our mind is really strong and for good reasons, right? Because it was programmed to help us survive. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't want to be too reflective. It's like tiger, go. (laughs) No discussion, no reflection. Let me, but so so it takes an act of courage to, to say, oh, I'm not sure it's a tiger. And the rest of your tribe is, oh, you're absolutely out of your mind. It's a tiger. Go. Right? So you step out of it. That takes that's an act of courage. And you and we can feel this in ourselves when we're stressed out. Usually when we're stressed out, we keep doing the bad behavior because so we keep running in the direction towards what we think is going to give us solace 
from this imagined threat, which can show up in all kinds of very unhealthy habits like overeating or not exercising or just watching TV way too long or staying in the conversation when it's way past due or arguing your point till, till the cows come home or not saying anything or gossiping, all that stuff. We stay in it because we don't think we have a choice. It's, is it because it's familiar and our brain likes familiarity? Yeah. Yeah. It's like grooves, right? Yeah. In the yeah. neuroscience, we talk about neurons that fire together, wire together. Huh. It's like when we do the same thing over and over, it's like when I drive here, I take 51 and then 202, and then the GPS gives me either Priest Drive or Broad Street. And I can get, a, get I can almost get upset. My brain gets upset when the GPS starts messing with me. It's like, wait, it was Broad Street. It's Priest Drive? What are you talking about? Right. So it likes that familiarity. Yeah. Also for, like, it's a, it's a good intelligent design because right? it's, like, imagine if every action was multiple alternatives, how I pick up a glass of water, how I drive my car, how I talk. I'd be not talking, oh, but I, 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 I wouldn't get any words out of my mouth. Which, interesting, also happens for people who have like deep enlightenment or, or insight experiences. There's a deep rewiring that happens, and sometimes the most mundane things they can't do because it's not familiar anymore because some of the old wiring goes like, poof, uh, hold on a second, <laughs> like, while we're rewiring ourselves. So it's an uncomfortable process. That's why I think this metaphor of the comfort zone is such a powerful one. Like learning, being human basically requires you to step out of the comfort zone if you want to grow. You don't have to. My, my teacher, who I talk to every Saturday at 8.30, her name is Janelle Reynolds, mid-80s. One of the amazing things about her, she never judges me. And she's seen me over the last 20 years in all kinds of stuff. And I won't uh, have all the details here on the table right now. And she just says to me, hmm, well, isn't that an interesting experience that you're having? And you can choose to have that same experience again and again and again. Or if you choose, you can have a different experience. It's up to you. Mm. And it's really up to you. And there, there's a sense of acceptance that comes from, from that. Yeah. Mm. How do people get to work with you? I mean, how, is it referral base? Or, and, and is there a particular type of company or team that you work best with? What, what is next for you and, and who's a good fit? Ah, okay. So we work with basically any leader, any team and any company that has willingness to engage on a journey of being real, mm -hmm. of creating a culture, atmosphere, situation of, of deep connectedness with what is true. And that, I love doing that in very challenging situations, right? So if your company is in trouble or you have a very high aspiration and you don't quite know how you're going to get over whatever hump that is, I love that. Because what we work with is working on the helping you work towards a specific goal and at the same time by looking at different ways of interacting with it, different conversations, different behaviors, while at the same time working on ourselves. So that that's my quote unquote ideal client, which I think it's a pretty wide thing. Then but the and then the, the other part, which is I think that because I'm getting a little older, we're starting to do more societally broad based initiatives. One of which is with you, right? So we launched this initiative called Connected Leaders for a More Livable World in Arizona. Now, that's an initiative that basically says problems cannot be resolved from the same level of consciousness that create them. And do we have a very rich sense of challenges right now in the world? Like, yeah, we all know them. They keep broadening in terms of what they are, climate change societal inequality, the prison pipeline, racism, shootings in schools. Education, education sustainability, susta homelessness. It, homelessness, <laughs> right? It, yeah. it doesn't end. It, it, doesn't, it seems to be exponentially increasing. Mm -hmm. So that's an initiative to say, okay, when you're a leader and you have a willingness to work on yourself and you have a willingness to be of service, 
you find yourself in a privileged position because not many people are right there. Join with others and work on your own consciousness and see what happens when you do that and also put yourself as a collective in service to address some of these intractable challenges. And at the same time, being a witness and student to how we're showing up in all of that. Yes. That's the personal journey piece of it. Yes. Yeah. And why Arizona? Ha. Huh. So Arizona, just like this conversation, fell into my lap in a way. My husband and I went here for his birthday. I wasn't at all interested in Phoenix or Arizona, living in Seattle at the time. And the first time I got here, I got the sense of, ooh, this is, I, 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 I found myself very happy. And I noticed a sense of harmony. It's interesting that Sky Harbor is called the friendliest airport in the country or the world. I'm not quite sure what the ad is, yeah. but something like that. And on this street here, even in a 5 million people city, people still greet each other. That's something I like. Mm -hmm. I also like Arizona because of the natural landscape, the desert. It's so vast. And the vastness reminds me of the presence, what we are in our essence. It's very unadorned. It's here. It doesn't matter what happens. It is here. That sort of constancy, Walt Whitman says, unfailing sufficiency, that I think is at the heart of each of us. We can call that love or peace or whatever that is, but I think the, the desert is such a reminder of it. And it doesn't like to be messed with very much. Like we humans build a city, but it's like, oh, if there's no water, it's going to be gone. It's very clear. And then the third part of this, of Arizona for me, is the native influence. Like I feel the, the native traditions mm -hmm. through the walls. And there's a lot of wisdom and connectedness with nature in that tradition, at least as far as I understand it, that I am an eager and humble student of. I love that you didn't come willingly. I mean, you came willingly for a little vacation <laughs> and thought that this isn't going to be for me and, right. and just sensed that, oh, this, there's something special here. Yeah. Which is a great metaphor. Again, going back to how to become a witness to ourselves. We're moving along and things are going all well and fine. And all of a sudden we bump up against something that doesn't feel good or we expect it to look and feel a certain way. If we lock into that and we are attached to the outcome or insistent that something has to be a certain way, then we're being of disservice to ourselves and not staying open to the gifts of imperfection, the gifts of opportunity, the gifts of connectedness or their lack of, because there's just as many gifts in the lack of connectedness as there is connectedness. Yes. As long as we're willing to look and see yes. what's here for me. As long as we're willing to see what's here for me. That's a t-shirt. <laughs> I love that. The, the, the word you've used a couple times is willingness. And is that synonymous with desire? To me, they're close cousins. Mm -hmm. Willingness to me in, implies also choice. So there's a yearning inside of us. While there may be many, many other voices that say, maybe not so much. I'm going to keep my old way, right? So one old pattern that I'm a witness to is that I tend to do things by myself because I don't trust people. Mm -hmm. My ego doesn't. Still, even after all the... After all that, yeah. there's still some, as you would say, in my cellular system, still some remnants of that memory left of not trusting. So that's still present. Mm -hmm. And there's an, a part in me that is yearning for deep connectedness with what is true, which includes deep connection with others. Mm -hmm. So from that yearning comes a willingness to say, okay, well, you maybe want to make a choice. But it's like there's the intrigue of the pool, but then you have to jump into it. <laughs> Right. And there's a there's a moment of surrender. It's like I don't know what's on the other side. Yeah. Desire is a little bit more like I know what a chocolate cookie is like and I'm gonna bite into it. Mm, that was good. Let's have another one. At least the way I relate yes. to it. And that may also be part of my journey. So I hold that also with a lot sure. of a lot of humility. I had, I had a counselor uh, years ago that I worked with. She used to say that I had a habit of saying, Come here, but I'd also be doing this. Come on, come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? Uh, with experiences and people. 
And that was a great way for me to visually see that I was in in this um, desire to be closer to people and also at the same time putting very tall walls up that says, okay, I'm going to invite you in, but the second you take a step closer, I'm also going to shove this wall up in front of you so that that you don't hurt me. (laughs) Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And the willingness is to be able to take a look at that and say, I don't know how to shift that, and I'm willing to to be uncomfortable <laughs> so I can figure that out. Yes, yeah. and I love the little laugh that you just did, <laughs> did there. I always call that a shadow laugh. <laughs> yeah, sh- beautiful, it's a right? a shadow laugh. It's a shadow laugh. That's beautiful. It's like I am standing here on the precipice, at least for part of me, feels like a precipice. And then when I took the step, it actually wasn't a precipice. It was. It's usually a soft landing. Hmm. Once I have allowed myself to truly let go, because what I noticed in my own healings of my own self, that I get deeper into it when I start to, for example, overanalyze, which is my way of pushing and not surrendering, not being willing. But if I'm willing to say, I don't know, I'm going to be present to this, I'm giving this over to, you could say, a higher transformative power that's bigger than my ego. Start there, like the little wiring here that's been conditioned for so many generations is passed on and then moved and mangled a little bit more and then morphed a little bit more. And like I try to solve it with that, that's mad. Mm-hmm. I just have to surrender it just into to a deeper place. On, on my walk here today, I was thinking, now this work is about the head, the heart, and the hands. Now, in the head, we have the we can say to ourselves, "Huh, something's up," but in the head, we can't usually solve the pattern. We can be aware of it. We hold it in the heart. I hold it in the heart, so that really hurts, doesn't it? You don't know what to do. This, okay, I give it over. Just sit with it, and this is also sitting with another person. And then the hands, ah, now from this place, I can be of service in the world differently. Mm -hmm. I reach out to Karen or I talk to my husband or I I talk to family, friends, or I, I, you know, write something, whatever it is. Consciously choosing to take action on whatever that sense or feeling is. Yes. And then being of service. Where can folks stay in touch with you and how they do that? You're on LinkedIn. Are you active on LinkedIn? I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, You can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, that's, and you can find our website as well, growthleadersnetwork.com. I know you have Rooted and Wavering that you, we help you produce here. Yes. Uh, that's available not only on Business Radio X, also on your website and all the major platforms. Yes, Spotify, Apple. Every, and I know at least for a while ago, you were doing another podcast. Do you still have the other one as well? Do you want to speak to that one? We are morphing the other podcasts okay. into working title, teamwork and connectedness. Good. So you were doing all these things. It's all focused on how do you bring teamwork to life through connectedness. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Hmm. And that doesn't matter on the personality or level of decision-making power (laughs) or experience. No. We all can benefit from connecting more deeply. Yes. It's teaming first with yourself, teaming with your teammates, teaming with the rest of your organization. And teaming with society. Mm-hmm. Right? And to me, that's very exciting. Yeah. And for, for the ego, that's really daunting. Like, no, I don't want to do this. I got my... And, I, and then I think of my friend uh, who was the president of the Global Child Nutrition Foundation until she was 96, 97 years old. Her name is Jean White. And you know, she had these lights in her eyes. And she would say to me, yeah, isn't it amazing how much we're learning and how much I'm learning about myself every day. And then I asked her about, well, Jean, you're 97. <laughs> well, 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 tell me about the what learning. What do you have left to learn? <laughs> right? And yeah. I said, so tell me about death and dying. Hmm. And she said, you know, life has been a pretty tremendous adventure. I'm sure death will be equally or even more so. And that sense of, that, that to me is like willingness with capital W. Yes. Like, ah, 
Like when I connect deeply to who I am, to who you are, where we are as society, what's going on with our teams, the whole mess of it, it becomes a miracle of adventure. It's like, oh, look at that. I have no idea and it's okay, but I'm going to give myself to it. And I just now, in that example, for me, I have more clarity around the difference between willingness and a desire. Willingness to embrace the dying experience when it comes doesn't mean she has the desire Mm -mm. to die today. Great distinction. Well, thank you. (laughs) You you just laid it out for me. Thank you, Jean White. (laughs) Yeah, thank you, Jean. That's phenomenal. Oh, my gosh. We're at the end of our time together. I mean, for this segment, we know that we have much more (laughs) uh, uh, in the works together. Growthleadersnetwork.com is where folks can find out more about your consultancy practice and the great folks who bring this work into the world alongside you. Yes. And uh, Taming the Crocodiles is available from the website as well, or where do we find the book? Everywhere. Yeah. Everywhere you find books. Mm-hmm. So yes, you can find Taming Your Crocodiles, the book. And there's there's another book called Taming Your Crocodiles Practices, which basically lays out uh, 77 practices to do this work as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Intrigued. Any lasting thoughts or wisdom that you want to leave our viewers and listeners with? I'm just grateful to be in this space with you, Karen, and with the listeners. And I invite you, if you're listening, to tap into what you're truly yearning for. Like, what is your true priority? If there was not a constraint of who you should be or what you should do, what are you truly yearning for? And and maybe go a little beyond what the desire might be. That might be okay too, but just a little deeper. And then gently hold that and allow yourself to plunge into it, maybe with a tippy toe. Uh, yeah, or a jump in. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you for sharing your time with us today. I know you had your most recent episode of Rooted and Unwavering just a little bit earlier today. And you and I get to reconnect next week to continue our planning on behalf of the Connected Leaders for a More Livable World. And if you are listening in here in Arizona and um, are intrigued by our conversation today, for that specifically, we'd love to hear from you. We'll be sharing more about that in the weeks to come. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. You've been listening to Phoenix Business Radio, broadcasting right out of Max 6 Entrepreneur Center right here in Tempe, Arizona. Some media leans left, some lean right, and we lean connectedness. Until next time, I'm Karen Nowicki. Thanks for listening. 